the two portraits in the banqueting hall. The banqueting hall lay immediately under the long gallery, corresponding with it in all but height, and though in this respect it fell somewhat short of the magnificent upper room, it was quite lofty enough to admit of a gallery of its own for spectators and minstrels. Great pains had been taken in decorating the hall of the occasion. Between the forest of stags that branched from the gallery rails were hung rich carpets intermixed with garlands of flowers and banners painted with arms of the Asherton family were suspended from the corners. Over the fireplace where, despite the advanced sea a pile of turf and wood was burning, were hung two panoplies of arms, and above them on a bracket was set a complete suit of mail, once belonging to Richard Ashton, the first possessor of the mansion. On the opposite wall hung two remarkable portraits, the one representing a religious botterus in a loose robe of black with wide sleeves, holding a rosary and misal in her hand, and having her brow and neck entirely concealed by the wimble in which her head and shoulders were enveloped. Such of her features as could be seen were of extraordinary loveliness, sort of a voluptuous character, the eyes being dark and Language and shaded by long lashes and the lips carnation hued and all. This was a fair votaress, I saw D. Heaton, who brought such scandal on the abbey in the reign of Henry the Sixth. The other portrait was that of an abbot in the white gown and scapulary of the sister Cian order. The countenance was proud and stern, but tinctured with melancholy. In a small shield at one corner, the arms were blazoned, argent, a vest between three mullets, sable, pierced of the field, a present or difference, proving it to be the portrait of Don Patel. All pictures had been found in the abbot's lodgings when taken possession of by Richard Aston, but they owe their present position to his descendant Sir Ralph, who, discovering them in an out-of-the-way closet where they had been cast aside and struck with their extraordinary merit, hung them up as above stated. At the lower end of the room beneath the gallery which it served to support was gothic screen, embellishing an open armoury which made a goodly display of silver plates and flagons. Though one of the doorways contrived in this screen, the May Day revellers were ushered into the hall by old Adam Whitworth, the white-headed steward. I pray you be seated, masters, and you too, comely dame, said Adam, leading them to the table, and assigning each plate with his one. All to and spare not, for it is my honoured master's desire you should so well. You will find that venison passe were trial, and the baked red ear in the centre of the table is a noble dish. The fellow to it was served at Sir Ralph's own table at dinner, and was pronounced excellent. I pray you try it, masters. Here, Ned Scargill, mind your office, good fellow, and break me that ear. And you, Paul Himlock, exercise your craft on the venison passe, and as trencher after trencher was rapidly filled by the two carvers who demanded themselves in their task like men acquainted with powers, rustic appetite, the old steward addressed himself to the dame. What can I do for you, fair mistresses? He said, Here be sat hosses, your kits, and cream, for such as like them, French puffs and Italian puddings, right good, I warrant you, and especially admired by my honourable good lady. Indeed, I am not sure she hath not lent a hand herself in their preparation. Then here be fritters in the court fashion, made with curds, sat hosses, eggs, and ale, and seasoned with nutmeg and pepper. You will taste them, I am sure, for they are favourites with our sovereign lady. Only here, Gregory Dickon, Bester, yourselves, knaves, and poor a cup of sack for each of these dames. As you drink, mistresses, neglect not this health of our honourable good master Sir Ralph and his lady. It is well, it is well, I will convey to them both your dutiful good wishes, but I must see all your wants fly. Good dame, open sure, you have no for you. Be prevailed upon to taste these dropped raisins or a fond pudding. And you too, sweet dame Tetlow. Squire Nicholas gave me special caution to take care of you, but the injunction was unneeded, as I should have done so without it. Another cup of canary to dame Tetlow Gregory. Fill it to the brim, up to the very brim. To the health of Squire Nicholas, he added in a low tone, as he handed a brimming goblet to the blushing dame, and he sure told him, if he questioned you, that I obeyed his behest to the best of my ability. I pray you taste this piping jelly, dame. It is as red as rubies, but not so red as your lips, or some leech of almond, which lily white though it be, is not to be compared with the tea that shall touch it. Odds heart, master steward, your mum had learned that pretty speech from the squire himself, I dame Tetlow laughing. It may be the recollection of something said to me by him, brought to mind by your presence, replied Adam, with gallantly. If I can serve you in old hell, sign to me, dame. Now fill the cup's ale or braggit at your pleasure, master drink, and sin not, and you will the best pleasure your liberal entertainer at my honoured master. Thus exhorted the guests set seriously to work to fulfil the hospitable intentions of the provider of the cups flowed fast and freely, and here long little was left of the venison pasty with the outrust, and nothing more than a few fragments of red ear. The lighter article then came in for a share of attention, and salmon from the ribble, jack trout and eels from the udder and calder, boiled, broiled, stewed, and pickled, and of delicious flavour were discussed with infinite relish. Puddings and pastry were left with more delicate stomachs and solids only being in request with the men. Hitherto the demolition of the viands had been sufficient employment, but now the edge of that art beginning to be dull. Tongues were unloosened and much merriment prevailed. More than eighty in number, the guests were dispersed without any regard to order, and thus the chief actors in the revel were scattered promiscuously about the table, diversifying it with their gay costumes. Robin Hood sat between two pretty female Morris dancers whose partners had got to the other end of the table, while Ned 
Puddle Son, the representative of Raya Tut, was equally fortunate, having a bosom dame on either side of him, towards whom he distributed his favours with singular impartiality. As for to the Abbey, Ned made himself at home, and next to Adam Whitworth was perhaps the most important person he present, continually roaring for ale and pledging the damsels around him. From the way he went on, it seemed highly probable that he would be under the table before supper was over, but Ned Puddle Son, like the burly priest whose gown he wore, had a stout bullet head through against all assaults of liquor, and the copious draughts he swallowed instead of subduing him only tended to make him more uproarious. Less also the lusty lungs, his shouts of laughter made the room ring again. But if the strong liquor failed to make you impression upon him, the like cannot be said of Jack Robbie, who it will be remembered to part of all, and who, having drunk over much, mistook the hobby horse for a real steed, and in an effort to bestride it fell head foremost on the wall, and being found incapable of rising, was carried out to an adjoining room and laid on a bench. This, however, was the only case of excess, although the Sherwood foresters empty their coats often enough to heighten their mirth. None of them seemed the worse for what they drank. Lawrence Blackrod, Mr. Parker's keeper, had fortunately got next to his old flame, Suki Worsley, while Phil Rawson, the forester who enacted Will Scarlet and Nancy Holt between them, whom an equally tender feeling subsisted, had likewise got together. A little beyond them sat the gentleman, Musher and Parish clerk, Samson Harrow, who, piquing himself on his good manners, drank very sparingly, and was content to sup on sweetments and all of leetings, as curds separated from the way are termed in this district. Tom the Piper and his companion, the Taborer, ate for the next week, but were somewhat more sparing in the matter of drink, their services as minstrels being required later on. Thus the various guests enjoyed themselves according to their bent and universal hilarity prevailed. It would be strange indeed if it had been otherwise, for what with the good cheer and the bright eyes around them, the rustics had attained a point of fallacy not likely to be surpassed. Of the numerous assemblage, more than half were of fairer sex, and of these the great portion were young and good-looking, while in the case of the Morris dancers their natural charms were heightened by their fanciful attire. Before supper was half over, it came so dark that it was found necessary to illuminate great lamps suspended from the centre of the room, while other lights were set on the board and two flaming torches placed in sockets on either side of the chimney piece. Scarcely was this accomplished when the storm came on so much the surprise of the weatherwise who had not calculated upon such an occurrence, not having seen any indications whatever of it in the heaven, but all were too comfortably sheltered and too well employed to pay much attention to what was going on without, and unless when a flash of lightning more than usually vivid dazzled the gaze or a peal of thunder more appalling than the rest were overhead, no alarm was expressed even by the women. To be sure, a little pretty trepidation was now and then evinced by the younger damsels, and even this was only done with a view of exacting attention on the part of their swain, and never failed in effect. Thunderstorm, therefore, instead of putting a stop to the general enjoyment, only tended to increase it. However, the last peal was loud enough to silence the most ferocious. The woman turned pale, and the men looked at each other anxiously, listening to hear if any damage had been done, but as nothing transpired, their spirits revived. A few minutes afterwards, word was brought about that the conventual church had been struck by a thunderbolt. This was not regarded as a very serious disaster. The bearer of the intelligence was little Janet, who said she had been caught in the ruined bad storm, and after being dreadfully frightened by the lightning, had seen a bolt strike steeple, and heard some stones rattle down, after which she ran away. No one thought of inquiring what she had been doing there at the time, but room was made for her at the table next to Samson Harrow, while the good steward, patting her on the head, filled her a cup of canary with his own hand, gave her some cake to eat. I don't see Alison, observed the little girl, looking round the table after she had the wine. Your sister is not here, Janet, replied Adam Whitworth with a smile. She's too great a lady for her now, since she came up with her ladyship from the green. She is being treated quite like one of the guests, and has been walking about the garden ruins all the afternoon with young Mrs. Dorothy, who has taken quite a fancy to her. Indeed, for the matter of that, all the ladies seem to have taken a fancy to her, and she is now closeted with Mrs. Nutter in her own room. This was Gal and Wormwood, Janet. She'll be hard pleased when she goes home again, after playing the fine dame here, pursued the steward. Then I hope she'll never come home again, rejoined Janet slightly. Oh, we do not want fine dame, I will cottage. For my part, I do not wonder, Alison, please, as a gentle walk, the Samson Harrow, since such pains have been taken with her manners and education, and I must say she does great credit to her instructor, who, for reasons unnecessary to mention, shall be nameless. I wish I could say the same for you, Janet, but though you're not deficient in ability, you have no perseverance or pleasure in study. I know as much as I care to know, replied Janet, and more than you can teach me, Master Harrow. Why is Alison always to be thrown by my team? Because she is the best model you can have, rejoined Samson. Ah, if I'd my own way with your last, I'd mend your temper and manner. You come off and ill stop your saucy sin. I come from the same stock as Alison, anyhow, said Janet. Unluckily, that cannot be denied, replied Samson. You're as different from her as light from dark. Janet eyed him bitterly and then rose from the table. I go, she said. No, no, sit down in poor good nature. She was dancing and past time will be in present and you'll see your sister. She will come down with the lady. That's the very reason she wishes to go, said Samson Harrow. A spiteful little creature cannot bear to see her sister being treated herself. Go your ways, then. It is the best thing you can do. Alison would blush to see you then. Then I am um, stay and better, replied Janet Sharp. Oh, I wanna sit near you any longer, Master Samson Harrow.
are who can yourself gentlemen or share or who are not gentlemen at all nor not like it, or merely parish clerk and schoolmaster and all schoolmaster do and go and sit by ski worse and Nancy Holt whom I see on the you found your match master Harrow said her she was laughing at the girl what way I should account it a disgrace and he were the like her I rejoined the clerk angrily but I'm greatly out in my reckoning she does not make a second mother them deep and worse could not well befall her Janet's society could have been very well disturbed with by her two friends but she would not be shaken on the contrary finding herself in the way she only determined the more pertinacious to remain and began to exercise all her powers of teasing which had been described as considerable and which on this occasion proved eminently successful and the worst of it was there was no crushing the clay little insect any effort made to catch her or result in escape on her part and a new charge on some undefended water was sharper singing and more tolerable than ever out of all patience Suki worsley at length exclaimed I should like to see you swung crosswise in the cow that Janet has answered her war this afternoon maybe you would suit her replied the little girl but I'm not so likely to be tried that way as yourself lass and if I were swung I should sing while you're with your broad back and shoulders with short claws and then you'd be counted a witch either not Suki said like rod unable to resist a laugh though the poor girl was greatly disappointed by this personal allusion ye may have a broad back of your own and broad the better to my mind but may word on it you'll never be taken for a witch you're far too comely this assurance was a balm to the poor Suki wounded spirit and she replied with a well pleased smile I hope I don't know like one lorry not a bit lass said like rod in the you jail to his lip your hell sweetheart what think ye then on Nan's redder observed Janet is she now comely I comely far than baffled see Suki or than Nancy Holt we her uh, you know her uh, and freckly faces yet he called her a witch he called thee one thou be a little when and the daughter or granddaughter a one and that's more cried and freckles I your own face ye mismanner to mince me and he her uh, Nan said Phil Ross and putting his arm around the angry damsel way and drawing her gently down everyone to his hips and freckles and yellow who are so to man so to no wreck about it spoil your pretty lip I pout better freckles or your face and spots on your heart like that ill wave little set do not offend her Phil said Nancy Holt no sin with alarm the malignant look fixed upon her lover by Janet she's dangerous first tech and apply the rust or who the jewel that I don't know no more and he's now one of our party the latter observation was occasioned by the entrance of a tall personage in the garb of a sister's young monk who issued from one of the doorways in the screen and glided towards the old table attracting general attention and misgivings as you see that his countenance was cadaverous his lips livid and his eyes black and deep sunken in their sockets with a visceral coloured circle around them his frame was meagre and bony what remained of air on his head was raven black but either he was bold on the crown or carried his attention to costume so far as to adopt the priestly tonsure his forehead was lofty and sallow and seemed stamped like his features with profound blue his garments were faded and mouldering and materially contributed to his ghostly appearance who is it cried Suke and Nancy together but no one could answer the question he does not look like a being of this world observed Black Rod gaping with alarm for the stout keeper was easily assailable on the side of superstition and there is a mouldy air about him that gives one the shivers to see I have often heard say that Abby is haunted and that hale faced chap looks like one of the monks risen from his grave during our revel I see he looks this way cried Phil Rawson what flaming mean they may the very flesh crawl of one bones it is a ghost lorry said Suke drawing nearer to the cell while keeper but the mask seems last they cannot tell replied Black Rod but whatever it be I'll protect ye take care of me Phil ejaculated Nancy Holt pressing closer to her lover's side I that I win rejoined the forester I don't care for ghosts so long as you are near me Phil said Nancy tenderly then I never leave ye Nancy replied Phil ghost or not said Janet who had been occupied in regarding the newcomer attentively I go and speak to it and now I third if you are I do Janet that's a brave little lass said Black Rod glad to be rid of her in any way stay cried Adam Whitworth coming up at a moment and overhearing what was said you must not go near the gentleman I will not have him molested or even spoken with till Sir Ralph is meanwhile the stranger without returning the glances fixed upon him or deigning to notice any of the company pursued his way and sat down in a chair at the old table but his entrance had been noticed by others beside the rustic guests and servitors Nicholas and Richard Ashton chanced to be in the gallery at the time and greatly struck by the singularity of his appearance immediately descended to make inquiries respecting him as they appeared below the old steward advanced to meet them who the devil have you got there adam asked the squire it passeth me almost to tell you master nicholas replied the steward and not knowing whether the gentleman be arrived or not i am fain to wait sir ralph's pleasure in regard to him have you no notion who he is inquired richard all i know about him may be soon told master richard replied adam he is a stranger in these parts and hath very recently taken up his abode in wiswall hall which has been abandoned of late years as you know and suffered to go to decay some few months ago an aged couple from Cone called who it took possession of part of the hall and was supposed to remain there though old katie who it or mold heels as she is familiarly termed by the common folk is in no very good repute hereabouts and was driven it is said from Cone owing to her passes as a witch be that as it may soon after these who it's were settled at wiswall comes this stranger and fixes himself in another 
other part of the hall. Now he lives, no one can tell, but it is said he rambles all night long like a troubled spirit about the deserted rooms, attended by mother Maldiels while in the daytime he is never seen. Can he be of sound mind? asked Richard. Hardly so, I should think, Master Richard replied Stewart. As to who he may be, there are many opinions, and some aver he is Francis Haslow, grandson of Francis, brother to the abbot, and being a Jesus priest, for you know the Haslow is all strictly adhered to the old faith, and that is why they have left the country and abandoned their residence. He is obliged to keep himself concealed. If such be the case, he must be seized indeed to venture here, observed Nicholas, and yet I am half inclined to credit the report. Look at him, Dick, he is very image of the old abbot. Yon portrait might have been painted by him, said Richard, gazing at the picture on the wall, and from him to the monk at his fault. The very same garb, too. There is an old monastic robe upstairs in the closet, adjoining the room occupied by Mr. Snutter, observed the steward, said to be the garment in which Abbot passed so death. Some stains are upon it, supposed to be the blood of the wizard MD, who perished in an extraordinary manner on the same day. I have seen it, cried Nicholas, and the monk's habit looks precisely like it, and in my eyes they see me not is stained in the same manner. I see the spots plainly on the breast, cried Richard. How can he have procured a robe? Heaven only knows, replied the old steward. It is a very strange occurrence. I will go question him, said Richard. So saying, he proceeded to the upper table, accompanied by Nicholas. As they drew near, the stranger arose and fixed a grim look on Richard, who was a little in advance. It is the abbot's ghost, cried Nicholas, stopping and detaining his cousin. You shall not address it during the contention that ensured the monk glided towards the side door at the upper end of the hall and passed through it. So general was the consternation that no one attempted to stay him, nor would anyone follow to see whither he went. Released at length from the strong grasp of the squire, Richard rushed forth and not returning. Nicholas, after the lapse of a few minutes, went in search of him, came back presently and told the old steward he could neither find him nor the monk. Master Richard will be back anon, I dare say, Adam, he remarked. If not, I will make further search for him. But you had better not mention this mysterious occurrence to Sir Ralph at all events, not until the best are over, and the ladies have retired. It might disturb him. I fear the appearance of this monk lords no good to our family, and what makes it worse is it is not the first ill omen that has befallen us today. Master Richard was unlucky in standing on Abbot Haslow's grave. Mercy on us, that was unlucky indeed, cried Adam in great trepidation. Poor dear young gentleman, bid him take a special care of himself with Master Nicholas. I noticed just now that yon fearsome monk regarded him more attentively than you. Bid him be careful, I conjure you, sir, for here comes my honoured master and his guests. Here, Gregory. Dixon, bestir yourselves, and serve supper at the upper table in a trice. Any apprehensions Nicholas might entertain for Richard were at this moment relieved, and as Sir Ralph and his guests came in at one door, the young man entered by another. He looked deathly pale. Nicholas put his finger to his lips in token of silence, a gesture which the other signified that he understood. Sir Ralph and his guests, having taken their places at the table, an excellent and plentiful repast was speedily set before them, and if they did not do quite such ample justice to it as the hungry rustics at the lower board had done to the good things provided for them, the cook could not reasonably complain, no allusion whatever being made to the recent strange occurrence, the cheerfulness of the company was uninterrupted, but the noise in the lower part of the hall had in a great measure subsided, partly out of the respect of the horse, and partly in consequence of the alarm occasioned by the towards supernatural visitation. Richard continued silent and preoccupied, and neither ate nor drank, but Nicholas, appearing to think his courage would be best sustained by an extra allowance of clary, and sat applied himself frequently to the goblet of that you, and ere long his spirits improved so wonderfully, and his natural boldness was so much increased that he was ready to confront Abbot Haslow or any other abbot of them all, whether they might chance to cross him in this enterprising frame of mind. He drew Richard aside and questioned him as to what had taken place in his pursuit of the mysterious monk. You overtook him, Dick, of course, he said, and put it to him roundly why he came hither, where neither ghost nor his suit priest, whichever he may be or wanted. What answered he here? Would I have been there to interrogate him? He would have declared how he became obsessed of that old moth eater bloodstained monkey gown. Or I would have unfrocked him even if he had proved to be a skeleton. But I interrupt you, you have not told me what occurred at the interview. There was no interview, replied Richard gravely. No interview, echoed Nicholas. It's a blood man, but I must be careful. For Dr. Ormerad and Parson Dewars are within hearing and may lecture me on the wantonness and profanity of swearing by St. Gregory de Northbury. No, that's an all to and what is worse, a poppy shawl. But I have several tremendous implications at my tongue's end. They shall not out. It is a simple prospensity and must be controlled. In a word, then you let him escape. Dick. If you were so anxious to save him, I wonder you came not with me, replied Richard. But you now hold very different language from what you used when I quitted the hall. Ah, true, right, Dick, replied Nicholas. My sentiments have undergone a wonderful change since then. I now regret having stopped you. By my troth, if I meet that confounded monk again, he shall give a good account of himself, I promise you. But what said he to you, Dick? Make an end of your story. I have not begun it yet, replied Richard. But pay attention, you shall hear what occurred when I rushed forward. The monk had already gained the entrance hall. No one was within it at time. All the serving men being busied here with a feasting, I summoned him to stay, but he 
he answered not, and still grimly regarding me, gliding towards the house door, which I know not by what chance stood open and passed him through it, closed it upon me. This delayed me a moment, and when I got out, he had already descended the steps and was moving towards the garden. It was bright moonlight, so I could see him distinctly, and mark this Nicholas, the two great bloodhounds were running about a large in the courtyard, but they slunk off as if armed at his appearance. The monk had now gained the garden, was shaping his course swiftly towards the ruined conventual church. Determined to overtake him, I quickened my pace. We gained the old fane before me, and threaded the broken aisles with noiseless celerity. In the quiet, he paused and confronted me. When, within a few yards of him, I paused, arrested by his fixed and terrible gaze. Nicholas, his look froze my blood. I would have spoken, but I could not. My tongue clove to the roof of my mouth for very fear. Before I could shake off this apprehension, the figure raised its hand menacingly, for I passed into the lacy chapel. As soon as he was gone, my courage returned, and I followed. The little chapel was brilliantly illuminated by the moon, but it was empty. I could only see the white monument of Sir Henry de Lacy glistening in pale radiance. I must take a cup of wine after this horrific relation, said Nicholas, replenishing his goblet. It has chilled my blood as a monk's icy gaze from yours. Body on me, but this is strange indeed, another oath. Lord help me, I shall never get rid of the infernal, I mean the evil habit. Will you not pledge me, Dick? The young man shook his head. You are wrong, pause Nicholas, decidedly wrong. Wine gladdeneth the heart of man and restore courage. A short while ago I was downcast as you, melancholy as an owl and timorous as a kid. But now I am resolute as an eagle, stout of heart and cheerful of spirit, and all owing to a cup of wine. Try the remedy, Dick, and get rid of your gloom. You look like a death's head at a festival. What if you have stumbled on an ill-omened grave? What if you have been banned by a wish? What if you have stood face to face with the devil or a ghost? Heed them not, drink, and set care at defiance, and not to gain say my own counsel, I shall fill my again. No, in good sooth, this is rare clarity, Dick, and talking of wine, you should taste some of the wonderful Rhenish found in the abbot cellar by our ancestor Richard Aston, a century old, if it be a day, and yet cordial and corroborative as ever. Those monks were lusty tipplers, Dick. I sometimes wish I had been an abbot myself. I should have made a rare father confessor, especially to a pretty penitent here. Gregory, hie thee to the master's cellar, and bid him fill me a goblet of old Rhenish, the wine from the abbot's cellar. Thou understandest, or stay better, bring the flask. I have profound respect for the bottle, and would hate my devours to it. Hie away, fellow. You will drink too much if you go on thus, remarked Richard. Not a drop, rejoined Nicholas. I am blithe as a lark, and would keep so. That is why I drink. But to return to our ghost, since this place must be haunted, I would it were visited by spirits of a livelier kind that old has so. There is a high soul, the Heaton, for instance, the fair Votaress would be the sort of ghost for me. I would not turn my back on her, but face her manfully. Look at her picture, Dick. Was ever countenance sweeter than hers? Lips more tempting, or eyes more melting? Is she not adorable? Zounds, he exclaimed, suddenly pausing and staring at the portrait. Would you believe it, Dick? The fair I saw winked at me. I'll swear she did, I mean. We'll venture to affirm upon oath, if quiet, that she winked. Peace, sure, exclaimed Richard. The fumes of the wine have mounted to your brain and disordered it. No such thing, cried Nicholas, regarding the picture as steadily as he could. She's leering at me now by the Queen of Hapos and will wink. Nay, if you doubt me, watch her well yourself. Pleasant adventure, this. Ha, ha. A truce in this drunken foolery, cried Richard, moving away. Drunken death recalled that epithet, Dick, cried Nicholas, angry, I am no more drunk than yourself, dog. I can walk as steadily and see as plainly as you, and I will maintain it at the point of the sword that the eyes of that picture have lovingly guarded me, nay, that they follow me now. A common delusion with portraits, said Richard. They appear to follow me, but they do not wink at you as they do at me, said Nicholas. Neither do the lips break into smiles, and display the pearly teeth beneath them as occurs in my case, for him old abbots frown on you, fair, though frail, but smile on me, I am the favoured mortal day. Were it as you represent, Nicholas, replied Richard, gravely, I would say indeed that some evil principle was at work to lure you through your passion to perdition, but I know they are all fancies engendered by your heated brain, which in your calmer moments you will discard, as I discard them now. If I have any weight with you, I counsel you to drink no more, or you will commit some mad foolery, of which you will be ashamed hereafter. The discreeter course will be to retire altogether, and for this you have ample excuse, as you will have to arise three times tomorrow, as to set out of Pendle Forest, we must part. Retire, exclaimed Nicholas, burst into a loud, contemptuous laugh. I lie thy counsel, lad, yes, I will retire. Retire when I have finished old monastic Rhenish, which Gregory is bringing me. I will retire when I have danced the Morris Hall with May Queen, the Cushing Dance, and Dame Tetlow, and the Brawl with lovely Isol de Hetton. Another will wink it by Our Lady, she ascends to my position. When I have done all this and somewhat more, it will be time to think of retiring, but I have the night for me, day not to be spent in drowsy unconsciousness, as thou recommendest, but in active, pleasurable enjoyment. No man requires less sleep than I do. Ordinarily, I retire as thou termest it at ten and rise with sun. In summer, I am brought soon after thee, free and mend that it canst if thou did. Tonight I shall seek my couch about midnight, yet I'll warrant me I shall be the first stirring in the abbey, and in any case I shall
shall be in the saddle before thee. It may be, replied Richard, but it was to preserve you from extravagance tonight that I volunteered advice which from my knowledge of your character I might as well have withheld. But let me caution you on another point. Dance with Dame Tetlow, or any dame you please. Dance with the fair eyes sold. He had only can fail on her descent from her frame and give you her hand. But I object most decidedly object to your dancing with Alice Price. Why so, cried Nicholas? Why should I not dance with him, I please? And what right hast thou to bid me, Alice? Troth, lad, art thou so ignorant of human nature as not to know that forbidden fruit is the sweetest it hath ever been so since the fall? I am now only the more bent on dancing with a prohibited damsel, but I would fain know the principle on which thou erectest thyself into a guardian. Is it because she fainted when thy sword was crossed with that hot headed fool, Sir Thomas Metcalf, that thou flatterest thyself she is in love with thee? Be not too sure of it, Dick. Many a timid wench has swooned at the sight of a naked weapon without being an armoured of the swordsman. The fainting proves nothing but for and she loves thee. What then? An end must speedily come of it, so better finish your once for she be entangled in a mesh from which she cannot be extricated without danger. For hardly Dick, whatever thou mayest think, I am not so far gone that I know not what I say. Neither is my vision so much obscure that I see not some matters plainly enough, and I understand thee and Alison well and see through you all. This matter must go no further, it has gone too far already. After tonight you must see her no more. I am serious in this serious interpocular. It is such a thing can be. It is necessary to observe caution for reasons that will at once occur to thee. Thou canst not wear this girl, then why trifle with her till her heart be broken? Broken it shall never be by me, cried Richard, but I tell you it will be broken if you do not desist at once, rejoined Nicholas. I was but jesting when I said I would rob you of her in the Morris Hall, though it would be charity to bore and spare you many a pang hereafter were I to put my threat into execution. However, I have a soft art where out of love is concerned, and having pointed out the risk you will incur, I shall leave you to follow your own devices. But for Alison's sake, stop in time. You now speak soberly and sensibly enough, Nicholas, replied Richard, and I thank you heartily for your counsel, and if I do not follow it by withdrawing at once from a shoot which may appear to you hopeless, if not dangerous, you will, I hope, give me credit for being actuated by worthy motives. I will at once and frankly admit that I love Alison, and loving her, you may rest assured that I would sacrifice my life a thousand times rather than endanger her happiness. But there is a point in her history with which, if you were acquainted, it might alter your view of the case. This is not the season for its disclosure, neither am I bound to say does the circumstance so materially alter the apparent posture of affairs as to remove all difficulty. On the contrary, it leaves an insurmountable obstacle behind it. Are you wise, then, in going on? asked Nicholas. I know not, answered Richard, but I feel as if I were the sport of fate, uncertain whither to turn for the best I have the disposition of my course to chance. But alas, he added sadly, all seems to point out that this meeting with Alison will be my last. Well, cheer up, lad, said Nicholas. These afflictions are hard to bear, it's true, but somehow they are got over, just as if your horse should fling you in the midst of a hedge when you are making a flying leap. You get scratched and bruised, but you scramble out, and in a day or two are on your legs again. Love breaks no bones, that's one comfort. When at your age I was desperately in love, not with Mistress Nicholas Asterton, heaven held and fond soul, but with never mind with him. But it was not a very prudent match, and so in my worldly wisdom I was obliged to cry off. A sad business it was, I thought I should have died of it, and I made quite sure that the girl would die first, in which case we were to occupy the same grave. But I was not driven to such a dire extremity, for I had kept house a wee Jack Walker, keeper a down, and made his appearance in my room, and after telling me of a mischief done by a pair of otters in the ripple, finding me in a very desponding state, ventured to inquire if I had heard the news. Expecting to hear of the death of the girl, I prepared myself for an outburst of grief, and resolved to give immediate direction for a double funeral when he informed me. What do you think, Dick, that she was going to be married to himself? I recovered at once, and immediately went after on the otters, and the rare sport he had, but here comes Gregory with his famous old Rhenish. Better take a day, this is the best cure of the heartache, and for all other aches and grievances, a glorious, so miraculous wine, he added, smacking his lips with extraordinary satisfaction after a deep draught. Those worthy fathers were excellent judges, I have a great reverence for them, but where can Alice be all this while? Super is well nigh over, and the dancing and pastimes will commence and on, and yet she comes not. She is here, cried Richard, as he saw Mistress Hunter and Alice and entered the hall. Richard endeavoured to read in the young girl's countenance some intimation of what had passed between her and Mistress Nutter, but he had only remarked that she was paler than before, and had traces of anxiety about her. Mistress Nutter also looked gloomy and thoughtful, and there was nothing in the manner of deportment or either to lead to the conclusion that a discovery of relationship between them had taken place. As Alison moved on, her eyes met those of Richard, but the look was intercepted by Mistress Nutter, who instantly called off her daughter's attention to herself, while the young man 
man hesitated to join them, his sister came up to him and drew him away in another direction, left to himself, Nicholas tossed off another cup of the miraculous Rhenish, which improved in flavour as he discussed it, and then placed in a chair opposite the portrait of Iceful, he had and filled a bumper, and uttering the name of Fair Votorus, drained it to her. This time he was quite certain he received a significant glance in return, and no one being near to contradict him, he went on indulging the idea of an amorous understanding between himself and the pitcher, till he had finished the bottle and obtained as many ogles as he swallowed rots of wine, upon which he arose and staggered off in search of Dame Tetlow. Meanwhile, Mistress Nutter, having made her excuses to Lady Asterton for not attending the supper, walked down the hall with her daughter until such time as the dancing pastime should commence. As will be readily supposed under the circumstances, this part of the entertainment was distasteful to all of them, but it could not be avoided without entering into explanations, which Mistress Nutter was unwilling to make, and she therefore counselled her daughter to act in all respects as if she were still Alison Device and in no way connected with her. I shall take an early opportunity of announcing my intention to adopt you, she said, and then you can act differently. Meantime, keep near me as much as you can, say a little to Dorothy or Richard Aston, and prepare to retire early for this nose and riotous assemblage is not much to my taste, and I care not how soon I quit it. Alison assented to what was said, and so Timmy glanced towards Richard and Dorothy, but the latter, who alone seated it, instantly averted her head in such a way as to make it evident she wished to shun her regards. Slight as it was, the circumstance occasioned Alison much pain, but she could not conceive how she had offended her new maid friend, and it was some relief to encounter a party of acquaintances who had risen from the lower table at her approach, though they did not presume to address her while she was with Mistress Nutter, but waited respectfully at a little distance. Alison, however, flew towards her. Ah, Susan, ah, Nancy, she cried, taking the hand of each. How glad I am to see you here, and you too, Lawrence Blackrod, and you, Bill Rawson, and you also, good Master Harrod. How happy you all look, and with good reason, sweet Alison, replied Blackrod. Both we began to be afeard with lost you, and that would have been a sore mishap to lose our May Queen, and the prettiest May Queen has ever danced at this eye uh, only over at uh, Lancashire. We are drunk your health, sweet Alison, added Phil, and wishing ye may be as happy as ye deserve with a man of your heart, if only such lucky chap there be. Thank you, thank you both, replied Alison, blushing, and in return I cannot wish you better fortune, Philip, than to be united to the girl near you, for I know her kindly disposition so well that I am sure she will make you happy. Satisfied on myself, replied Rawson, and I hope ere long she'll be Mrs. or Little Cart of Fallen Forest, and that you'll pay us a visit, Alison, and see and judge for yourself how happy we be. Nance win make a rare forester's wire, not a bit better than my suke, cried Lawrence Blackrod. Ye shanna get the start of me, Bill, for by the mess the same very day I see you wedded to Nance Holt, she shall find me united to Suki Worsley, and so Alison win her two cottages at Fallen Forest to visit instead of one, and well pleased I shall be to visit them both, she rejoined. At this moment, Mistress Nutter came on. My good friend, she said, as you appear to take so much interest in Alison, you may be glad to learn that it is my intention to adopt her as a daughter, having no child of my own, and though her position henceforth will be very different from what it has been, I'm sure she will never get her old friend. Never indeed, never, cried Alison earnestly. This is good news indeed, cried Samson Harrow joyfully, while the others joined in in his exclamation. We all rejoice in Alison's good fortune, and think she richly deserves it. For my own part, I was always sure she would have rare luck, but I did not expect such luck as this. What's to become of me, cried Janet, coming from behind the chair, where she had hitherto concealed herself. I will always take care of you, replied Alison, stopping and kissing her. Do not promise more than you may be able to form, Alison observed Mistress Nutter, coldly and regarding the little girl with a look of disgust, an ill-favoured little creature with a dem deep eyes, and as ill-tempered as she is ill-favoured, rejoined Samson Harrow, and though she cannot help being ugly, she might help being malicious. Janet gave him a bit of luck. You do her an injustice, Master Harrow, said Alison. Poor little Janet is quick-tempered, but not malevolent. I can hate Will if he cannot look like Janet, and can't recollect injuries if I forget kindness. Says, oh, don't know, trouble yourself about me, sister. I don't know, envy ye your look. I don't know, want to be adopted by a grand dame. I content us. I am both. Are ye not getting on rather too fast, lass? Mother's consent has to be asked, I suppose. I will eat leave her. There is little fear of her refusal, observed Mistress Nutter. I don't know that, rejoined Janet. If she were to refuse it, wouldn't that surprise me? Nothing spiteful she could do would surprise me, remarked Harrow. But how are you likely to know what your mother will think and do, you forward little upset? I judge for circumstances, replied the little girl. Mother has often said she can a wheel spare Alice, and mayhap Mistress Nutter may know that she can be very obstinate when she takes a whim into her head. I do know it, replied Mistress Nutter, and from my experience of her temper in former days, I should be loath to have you near me. Who seem to inherit her obstinacy? Why such misgivings, I wonder, you wish to talk Alice and Madam Sir Janet, for she's as much a mother about her as me, and if she doesn't choose to show it. Peace thou mischievous urchin, 
cried mistress until losing all her patience. Shall I take her away? cried Harrow, seizing her hand. I do, said mistress Hunter. No, no, let her stay, cried Alison quickly. I shall be miserable if she goes. Oh, I'm quite ready to go, said Janet, for I care little for such sights as this. For a fall, leave my wide vein, say a few words of my thoughts whom I see yonder. What can you want with him, Janet? cried Alison in surprise. Only to tell him what brother Jem is gone to Pendle for to me, supplied a little girl with a significant and malicious look at mistress Hunter. Ha, muttered the lady, there is more malice in this little wasp than I thought, but I must rob it of its sting. And while thus commuting with herself, she fixed a searching look on Janet, and then raised her hand quickly, waved it in her face. Oh, cried the little girl, falling suddenly backwards. What's the matter? demanded Alison, flying to her. I don't know, really, no, replied Janet. She sees with a sudden vainness, said Harrow. Better she should go home then at once. I'll find somebody to take her. No, no, and sit down here, said Janet. I shan't be better soon. Come along, Alison, said Mr. Hunter, apparently unconcerned at the circumstance, having confided the little girl who was now recovered from the shock to the care of Nancy Holt. Alison followed her mother. At this moment, Sir Ralph, who had quitted the supper table, clapped his hands loudly, thus giving the signal to the minstrels who, having repaired to the gallery, now struck up a merry tune, and instantly the whole hall was in motion. Snatching up his wand, Samson Harrow hurried after Alison, beseeching her to return with him, and join a procession about to be formed by the revellers, and of course, as May Queen, and the most important personage in it, she could not refuse. A very short space sliced the Morris dancers to find their partners, Robin Hood, and the foresters got into their places, and the hobbyos curveted and capered. Fry Truck resumed his drolleries, and even Jack Robbie was so far recovered as to be able to get on his legs, though he could not walk very steadily. Marshalled by the gentleman usher, and headed by Robin Hood and the May Queen, the procession marched around the hall, the minstrels playing merrily the while, and then drew up before the supper table where a brief oration was delivered by Sir Ralph. A shout that made the rafters ring again followed the address, after which a coranto was called for by the horse, who, taking Mistress Nicholas Ashton by the hand, led her into the body of the hall with her. He was speedily followed by the guests who had found partners in like manner. Mistress Nicholas Ashton excelled in the graceful accomplishment of dancing, and that was probably the reason why she had been selected for the coranto by Sir Ralph, who knew the value of a good partner. By many persons, she was accounted the handsomest woman in the room, and in dignity of carriage, she was certainly unrivaled. This was precisely what Sir Ralph required, and having executed a few current traverses and sliding passages with a with a gravity and stateliness worthy of Sir Christopher Hatton himself, when graced by the hand of his sovereign mistress, he conducted her amid the hushed admiration of the beholders to a seat. Still, the dance continued with unabated spirit, all those engaging in it running up and down, or turning and winding and unlooking for change. Alison's hand had been claimed by Richard Aston, and next to the stately horse and his dignified partner, they came in for the largest share of admiration and attention, and if the untutored girl fell short of the accomplishments, dame in precision and skill, she made up for the want of them in natural grace and freedom of movement for this play, of which the coranto, with its frequent and impromptu changes, afforded ample opportunity. Even Sir Ralph was struck with her extreme gracefulness, and pointed her out to the mistress, Nicholas, who, unenvying and amiable, joined heartily in his praises. Overhearing what she was said, Mistress Nutter thought it a fitting opportunity to announce her intention of adopting the young girl, and though Sir Ralph seemed a good deal surprised at the suddenness of the declaration, he raised no objection to the plan, but on the contrary applauded it. But another person, by no means disposed to regard it in equally favourable light, came acquainted with the intelligence at the same time. This was Master Potts, who instantly set his wits at work to discover its import. Ever on the alert, his little eyes sharp as needles had detected Janet amongst the rusty company, and he now made his way towards her, resolved by dint of cross-questioning and otherwise to extract all the information he possibly could from her. The dance over, Richard and his partner wandered towards a more retired part of the hall. Why does your sister shun me? inquired Alison, with a look of great distress. What can I have done to offend her? Whenever I regard her, she averts her head, and as I approached her just now, she moved away, making it evident she designed to avoid me. If I could think myself in any way different from what I was this morning, when she treated me with such unbounded confidence and kindness, or accused myself of any events towards her, even in thought I could understand it, but as it is her present coldness appears inexplicable and unreasonable, and gives me great pain, I would not forfeit her regard for worlds, and therefore beseech you to tell me what I have done, and miss that I may endeavour to repair it. You have done nothing, nothing whatsoever, sweet girl, replied Richard. It is only caprice on Dorothy's part and except that it distresses you, her uh, conduct, which you justly call unreasonable, does not deserve a moment's serious consideration. Oh no, you cannot deceive me, thus cried Alison. She is too kind, too well judging to be capricious. Something must have occurred to make her change her opinion of me. Though what it is, I cannot conjecture. I have gained much today, more than I have any right to expect. But if I have forfeited the good opinion of your sister, the loss of her friendship will counterbalance all the rest. But you have not lost it, Alison, replied Richard earnestly. Dorothy's got some strange notions into her head, which only requires to be but she does not like Mistress Nutter, and is pecued and displeased by the extraordinary interest which that lady displays towards you. That is all. But why should she not like Mistress Nutter? 
required Alison Nee. There is no accounting for Vance's return, which will remain smile. I do not attempt to defend her, but simply offer the only excuse in my power for her conduct. I am concerned to hear it, said Alison sadly, because henceforth I shall be so intimately connected with Mistress Nutter that this estrangement, which I hope to rose only from some trivial cause, and merely required a little explanation to be set aside, may become widened and lasting. Owing everything to Mistress Nutter, I must espouse her cause, and if your sister likes her not, she likes me not in consequence, and therefore we must continue divided. But surely her dislike is a very recent date and cannot have any strong upon her in hold, for when she and Mistress Nutter met this morning, a very different feeling seemed to animate her. So indeed it did, replied Richard, visibly embarrassed and distressed. And since you have made me acquainted with a new tie and interest you have formed, I can only regret alluding to the circumstance that you may not misunderstand me, said Alison. I will explain the extent of my obligations to Mistress Nutter, and then you will perceive how much I am bound to her. Childless herself, greatly interested in me and feeling for my watching a situation with infinite goodness, ah, she has declared her intention of removing me from all chance of painful influence. From the family with whom I have been heretofore connected by adopting me as her daughter, I should indeed rejoice at this, said Richard, were it not that, and he stopped gazing anxiously at her. Were not what, cried Alison, alarmed by his looks, what do you mean? Do not press me further, he rejoined, I cannot answer you. Indeed, I have said too much already. You have said too much or too little, cried Alison, speak, I implore you. What means these dark hints which you throw out, and which light shadows elude all attempts to grasp them? Do not keep me in this state of suspense and agitation. Your looks speak more than your words, or give your thoughts utterance. I cannot, replied Richard, I do not believe what I have heard, and therefore will not repeat it. It would only increase the mischief. But all tell me this, was it indeed to remove you from the painful influence of Elizabeth device that Mistress Nutter adopted you? Other motives may have swayed her, and I have said they did so, replied Alison. But that wish, no doubt, had great weight with her. Nay, notwithstanding her abhorrence of the family, she was kindly consented to use her best endeavours to preserve little Janet from further ill, as well as to reclaim poor misguided Elizabeth herself. Oh, what a weight you have taken from my heart, cried Richard joyfully. I will tell Dorothy what you say, and it will at once remove all her doubt and suspicions. She will now be the same to you as ever, and to Mistress Nutter. I will not ask you what these doubts and suspicions were, since you so confidently promised me this, which is all I desire, replied Alison, smiling. But any unfavourable opinions entertained of Mistress Nutter are wholly undeserved, all lady. She has endured many severe trials and sufferings, and whenever you learn the whole of her history, she will, I am sure, have your sincere sympathy. You have certainly produced a complete revolution in my feelings towards her, said Richard, and I shall not be easy till I have made a light convert of Dorothy. At this moment, a loud clapping of hands was heard, and Nicholas was seen marching towards the centre of the hall, preceded by the minstrels, who had descended for the purpose from the gallery, and bearing in his arms a large red velvet cushion. As soon as the dancers had formed a wide circle around him, a very lively tune called John Sanderson, from which the dance about to be executed sometimes received his name was struggled, and the squire, after a few preliminary flourishes, set down the cushion and gave chase to Dame Tetlaw, who, treading her way rapidly through the ring, contrived to elude him. This chase, accompanied by music, excited shouts of laughter on all hands, and no one knew which most to admire the eagerness of the squire or the dexterity of the lissom dame in avoiding him. Exhausted at length and baffled in his quest, Nicholas came to a halt for Tom the Piper, and taking up cushion, thus preferred his complaint. This dance it can go no further, no further go. Whereupon the Piper chanted in reply, I pray you, good sir, why say you so? Why say you so? And Miss General Laughter, the squire, tenderly and touchingly responded, because Dame Tetlaw will not come to, will not come to. Whereupon Tom the Piper, waxing furious, blew a shrill whistle, accompanied by an encouraging rattle of the tambourine, and enforcing the mandate by two or three energetic stamps on the floor, delivered himself in this fashion. She must come to, and she shall come to, and she must come, whoever she will or not. Upon this two of the prettiest female Morris dancers, taking each a hand of the blushing and overheat Dame Tetlaw, for she had found the chase rather warm work, led her forward, while the squire, advancing very gallantly, placed the cushion upon the ground before her, and as she knelt down upon it, bestowed a smacking kiss on her lips. This ceremony being performed amidst much tittering and flustering, accompanied by many noise, looks, and some expressed wishes among the swains who hoped that their turn might come next. Dame Tetlaw rose, and the squire, seizing her hand, they began to whisk round in a sort of singing merrily as they danced. Princom, Princom is a fine dance, and we shall go dance it once again, once again, and we shall go dance it once again. And they may go the word too, for on coming to a stop, Dame Tetlaw snatched the cushion and ran in search of the squire, who, retreating among the surrounding damsels, made sad havoc among them, scarcely leaving the pretty pair of lips unvisited. Oh, Nicholas, Nicholas, I am thoroughly ashamed of you, and regret coming your historian. Get me into an infinitude of scraps. There is a rod in pickle for you, sir, which shall be used with a good effect presently. Tired of such an unprofitable quest, Dame Tetlow came to a sudden halt, addressed the piper as Nicholas had addressed him, and receiving a like answer, summoned the delinquent to come forward. But as he knelt down on the cushion, instead of receiving the anticipated salute, he got a sound box on the ears, and Dame actuated, probably by some feeling of jealousy, taking advantage of the favour, able opportunity of avenging herself. No
no one could refrain from laughing at this unexpected turn of affairs, and Nicholas, to do him justice, took it in excellent part and laughed louder than the rest. Springing to his feet, he snatched the kiss denied him by the spirit of Dame and led her to obtain some refreshments at the lower table, of which they both stood in need, while the cushion being appropriate by other couples, other boxes on the ear and kisses were interchanged, leading to an infinitude of merriment. Long before the master Potts had found his way to Janet, and as he drew near, vexing to notice her for the first time, he made some remarks upon her, not looking very well. Did and I am now very well, replied the little girl, for I know who had find for my ailment your sister most probably suggested the attorney, it must be very vexatious to see her so much notice, and be yourself so much neglected, very vexatious indeed, I quite feel for you. I do not want your feeling, replied Janet, nettled by the remark, but it wasn't my sister who made me ill. Who was it then, my little dear, said Potts? Don't dear me, retorted Janet, you're too evil by our the lamb, said the wolf, or sin you more no, if it were Mistress Nutter. Oh, very good, I mean, very bad, cried Potts. What did Mistress Nutter do to you, my little dear? Don't be afraid of telling me. If I can do anything for you, I shall be very happy to speak out, and don't be afraid. Nay, for sure, I am not afraid, turned Janet, or what means ye so inquisitive? You want to get some out of me, and can't see that plain enough, and I see your stone there glancing at me with your sly little eye, and looking like an old fox ready to snap a chicken on the first opportunity. Your comparison is not very flattering, Janet, replied Potts, but I pass it by for the sake of its cleverness. You are a sharp child, Janet, a very sharp child, I remarked, that from the first moment I saw you, but in regard to Mistress Nutter, she seems a very nice lady, and must be a very kind lady, since she has made up her mind to adopt your sister. Not that I am surprised at her termination, for really Alison is so superior, so unlike me, you was say, interrupted Janet. Don't be afraid to speak out, sir. No, no, replied Potts, on the contrary, there's a very great likeness between you. I saw you, you were sisters at once, I don't know which is the cleverest of but perhaps you are the sharpest. Yes, you are the sharpest, undoubtedly, Janet, if I wish to adopt anyone, which unfortunately I'm not in a condition to do, having only bachelor's chambers in Chancery Lane, it should be you, but I can put you in a way of making your fortune, Janet, and that's the next best thing to adopting you, indeed. It's much better in my case. May my fortune, cried the little girl, pricking up her ears. I should like to know how you would contrive that. I'll show you how directly Janet returned. Pop, pay particular attention to what I say. You think it over carefully when you are by yourself. You are quite aware that there is a great talk about witches in these parts, and if I may speak it without offence to you, your own family come under the charge. There is your grandmother, MD, for instance, notorious witch, your mother, Dame Device, suspected your brother James, suspected well, sir, cried Janet, eyeing him sharply. What does all this suspicion tend to? You shall hear, my little dear, return Pops. It would not surprise me if every one of your family, including yourself, should be arrested, shut up in Lancashire Castle, and burned for witches. A lack of day, and this you can make him my fourteen, cried Janet, derisively. Much obliged to you, sir, both idle leave be without a look. Listen to me, sure, Pops, Lynn, and I will point out to you a way of escaping the general fate of your family. Not merely of escaping, but of acquiring a large reward, and it is by giving evidence against them, by telling all you know. You understand? I, yeah, I think I do understand, replied Janet, sternly. And so this is your grand scheme, eh, sir? This is my grand scheme, Janet, said Potts, and I notably regard it as a scheme. My little lass, think it over, you're an admissible and indeed a desirable witness for our sagacious sovereign who expressly observed that barns, I believe, call children barns in Lancashire, Janet, your uncow dialect very much resembles the Scottish language in which our learned manner writes as well as speaks. Ben says he, or wives, or never so defamed persons may of our law serve all sufficient witnesses and proofs. For who but witches can be proofs and so witnesses of the doings of the witches? For I am no witch, and I tell you, Mon, cried Janet angrily, but you're a witches burn, my little lassie, replied Potts, and that's just as bad, and you've grown up to be a witch in due time. That is, if your career be not short, I'm sure you must have witnessed some strange things when you visited your grandmother at Malkin Tower. That, if I mistake not, is the name of a reward, and a fearful and witch-like name it is. You must have heard frequent mutterings and curses, spells, charms, and diabolical incarnations, veiled strange and monstrous visions, listened to threats uttered against people who were afterwards perished unaccountably. I've heard and seen no to the sort, replied Janet, for and heard my mother threaten you, and indeed cried Potts forced in a laugh, but looking rather blank afterwards. And how did she threaten me, Janet, eh? But no matter, let that pass for the moment. As I was saying, you must have seen mysterious proceedings over at Malton Tower, and your own house. A black gentleman with a club folk must visit you occasionally, and your mother must now and then say once a week, take a fancy to ride in on a broomstick. Are you quite sure you have never ridden on one yourself, Janet, and got a whistle the chimney without being aware of it? It's the common witch conveyance, and said to be very expeditious and agreeable, but I can't vouch for it myself. Ha <laughs> ha, possibly though you are rather young, but possibly I say you may have attended a witch's sabbath and seen a huge he goat with four horns on his head and a large tail seated in the midst of a large circle of devoted admirers. If you have seen this and can recollect the names and faces of the assembly, it would be highly important. When I see it, I shall not forget it, replied Janet, for I am quite so familiar with old strats as you seem to suppose. Has it ever occurred to you that Alison might be addicted to these practices of two parts and that she obtained her extraordinary and otherwise unaccountable beauty by some magical process, some charm, some diabolical undue? and prepared as the Lord's keeper.
Harper of Privy Seals, singular learned Lord Eker declares, from fat of unbaptized babies compounded with henbane, hemlock, mandrake, moonshade, and other terrible ingredients, she could not be so beautiful without some such aid. That shows how little you know about it, replied Janet. Alison is as good as she's pretty, and don't know your thing to wheedle me into saying I'll get her for you when I do it. I'd rather than harm a her on her head. Very praiseworthy indeed, my little dear, replied Potts ironically. I honour you for your sisterly affection, but notwithstanding all this, I cannot help thinking she was bewitched. Mistress Nutter, liquor, Mistress Nutter has bewitched her, replied Janet. Then you think Mistress Nutter is a witch, eh? cried Potts eagerly. I will not tell you what I think, man, rejoined Janet dodgily. But hear me, cried Potts, I have my own suspicions. Also, nay, more than suspicions. If ye are sure you don't want me, said Janet, but I want a witness to shoot Potts, and if you'll serve as one, who ye get me, said Janet, whatever you like, rejoined Potts, only name the sum, so you can prove practice of witchcraft against Mistress Nutter. Janet nodded, why he like to know why Brother Jem is gone to Pendle tonight, she said. Very much indeed, replied Potts, throwing still nearer to her. Very much indeed, the little girl was about to speak, but on a sudden, a sharp convulsion agitated her frame, her utterance totally failed her, and she fell back in the seat, insensible. Very much startled, Potts flew in search of some restorative, and on doing so, see Mistress Nutter moving away from this part of the hall. She has done it, he cried, a piece of witchcraft for my very eyes. She has killed a child, no, she breathes, and her pulse beats so faintly. She is only a swoon, deep and death like one. It would be useless to attempt to revive her. She must come to in her own way, or at the pleasure of the wicked woman who has fallen her into this condition. I have now an assured witness in this girl, but I must keep watch on Mistress Nutter's further movements. And he walked cautiously after her, as Richard had anticipated. His explanation was perfectly satisfactory to Dorothy and the young lady, who had suffered greatly from the restraint she had imposed upon herself. Flew to Alison, called for excuses which were as readily accepted as they were freely made. They were instantly as great friends as well, and their brief estrangement only seemed to make them dearer to each other. Dorothy could not forgive herself, and Alison assured her that there was nothing to be forgiven, and so they took hands upon it and promised to get all their class. Richard Spy delighted with the change and wrapped up in the contemplation of the object of his love, who thus engaged seeming to him more beautiful than he had ever beheld her. Towards the close of the evening, while all three were still together, Nicholas came up to Richard's side, smiled with flush, and there was an undefined expression of alarm in his countenance. What is the matter? inquired Richard, dreading to hear of some new calamity. Have you not noticed it? said Nicholas in a hollow tone. The portrait is gone. What portrait? exclaimed Richard, getting the previous circumstances. The portrait of I saw the Hetton, returned Nicholas, becoming more sepulchral in his accents as he proceeded. It has vanished from the wall. See and believe. Who has taken it down? cried Richard, remarking that picture as certainly feared. No mortal hand, replied Nicholas. It has come down of itself. I knew what would happen, Dick. I told you the bear. Votarus gave me the chindy seal, the wink. You would not believe me then. And now you see your mistake. I see nothing but bare walls, said Richard. But you will see something. And on Dick joined Nicholas with a hollow laugh and in a dismal tone. You will see I saw herself. I was foolhardy enough to invite her to dance for with me. She smiled her assent and winked at me thus very significantly. I test you and she will be as good as a word. Absurd, exclaimed Richard. Absurd, sayest thou? Thou art an infidel and believest nothing, Dick, cried Nicholas. Does thou not see that picture is gone? She will be here presently. Ha, the brawl is called. The very dance I invited her to. She must be in the room now. I will go in search of her. Look out, Dick. Thou wilt behold a sight presently shall make thine hair stand on end. And he moved away with a rapid but uncertain step. The port of wine has confused his brain, said Richard. I must see that no mischance befalls him. And waving his hand to his sister, he followed the squire, also moving on, stared inquisitively into the countenance of every pretty damsel he encountered. Time had flown fleetly with Dorothy and Alison, who, occupied with each other, had taken little note of its progress, and were surprised to find how quickly the hours had gone by. Meanwhile, several dancers had been formed, a uh, Morisco, in which all the May Day revelers part, with the exception of the Queen herself, who, notwithstanding the united entreaties of Robin Hood and her gentleman Usher, could not prevail upon to join it. A trench more, a sort of long country dance extending from the bottom of the hall, and in which the hall of the rustic stood up, galliard confined to the more important guests, and in which both Alison and Dorothy were included, the former dancing, of course, with Richard, and the latter with one of her cousins, young Joseph Rogginson, a gee quiet, promiscuous, and unexclusive, and not the less merry on that count. Throughout the evening, Alison had been closely watched by Mistress Nutter, who remarked with feelings akin to jealousy and distrust, the marked predilation exhibited by her for Richard and Dorothy Ashton, as well as her inattention to her own expressed injunctions in remaining constantly near them. Though secretly displeased at this, she put a calm face upon it, and neither remonstrated by word or look. Thus, Alison, feeling encouraged by the course she had adopted and prompted by her inclinations, soon got her into direction she had received. Mistress Nutter even went so far in her duplicity as to promise Dorothy that Alison should pay her an early visit at Middleton.
Nintendo inwardly resolving no such visit should ever take place. However, she now received the proposal very graciously and made Alison quite happy in ascending to it. I would fain have her go back with me to Middleton when I return, said Dorothy, but I feel you would not like to part with your newly adopted daughter so soon, neither would it be quite fair to rob you of her, but I shall hold you to your promise of an early visit. Mistress Nutter replied by a bland smile and then observed to Alison that it was time for them to retire and that she had stayed on her account far later than she intended. A mark of consideration duly appreciated by Alison. Farewells for the night were then exchanged between the two girls and Alison looked round to bid adieu to Richard who, unfortunately at this very juncture, was engaged in pursuit of Nicholas. Before quitting the hall she made inquiries after Janet and receiving for answer that she was still in the hall but had fallen asleep in a chair at one corner of the side table and could not be wakened. She instantly flew thither and tried to rouse her but in vain when Mistress Nutter coming up the next morning merely touched her brow and the little girl opened her eyes and gazed about her with a bewildered look. She is unused to these late hours, poor child, said Alison. Someone must be found to take her home. You need not go far in search of a convoy, said Potts, who had been hovering about and now set up. I am going to the dragon myself and shall be happy to take charge of her. You are over officious, sir, rejoined Mistress Nutter coldly. When we need your assistance, we will ask it. My own servant Simon Blackadder will see her safely home. And at a sign from her, a tall fellow with a dark, scowling countenance came from among the other serving men and receiving his instructions from his mistress, seized Janet's hand and strode off with her. During all this time, Mistress Nutter kept her eyes steadily fixed on the little girl who spoke not a word nor replied even by a gesture to Alison's affectionate good night, retaining her days up to the moment of quitting the hall. I never saw her thus before, said Alison. What can be the matter with her? I think I could tell you, rejoined Potts, glancing maliciously and significantly at Mistress Nutter. The lady darted an eyeful and piercing look at him, which seemed to produce much the same consequences as those experienced by Janet, for his visage instantly elongated and he sank back in a chair. Oh dear, he cried, putting his hand to his head. I'm struck all of a heap. I feel a sudden qualm, a giddiness, a sort of don't know howishness. Or oh, there's some aqua vitae or imperial water or cinnamon water or whatever reviving cordial may be at hand. I feel very ill, very ill indeed, oh dear. While his requirements were attended to, Mistress Nutter moved away with her daughter, but they had not proceeded far when they encountered Richard, who, having fortunately described them, came up to say goodnight. The brawl, meanwhile, had commenced and the dancers were whirling round giddily in every direction, somewhat like the couples in a grand polka, danced after a very boisterous, romping and extravagant fashion. Who is Nicholas dancing with? asked Mistress Nutter suddenly. Is he dancing with anyone? rejoined Richard, looking amongst the crowd. Do you not see her? said Mistress Nutter, a very beautiful woman with flashing eyes. They move so quickly that I can scarcely discern her features, but she is habited like a nun. Like a nun, cried Richard, his blood flowing, chill in his veins. Is she indeed then? Where is he? Yonder, yonder, whirling madly round, replied Mistress Nutter. I see him now, said Richard, but he is alone. He has lost his wits to dance in that strange manner by himself. How wild, too, is his gaze. I tell you, he is dancing with a very beautiful woman in the habit of a nun, said Mistress Nutter. Strange, I should never have remarked her, for no one in the room is to be compared with her in loveliness, not even Alison. Her eyes seem to flash fire, and she bounds like a wild roar. Does she resemble the portrait of Isol de Hetton? asked Richard, shuddering. She does, she does, replied Mistress Nutter. See? She whirls past us now. I can see no one but Nicholas, cried Richard. No, I, added Alison, who shared in the young man's alarm. Are you sure you behold that figure, said Richard, drawing Mistress Nutter aside and breathing the words in her ear? If so, it is a phantom, or he is in the power of the find. He was rash enough to invite that wicked butterous I saw the Hetton condemned, it is said, to penal fires for her earthly enormities to dance with him, and she has come. Ha! exclaimed Mistress Nutter. She will whirl him round till he expires, cried Richard. I must free him at all hazards. Stay, said Mistress Nutter. It is I who have been deceived. Now I look again, I see that Nicholas is alone, but the nun's dress and wondrous beauty, the flashing eyes, cried Richard, you described, I saw exactly, it was mere fancy, said Mistress Nutter, I had just been looking at her portrait, and it dwelt on my mind and created the image. The portrait is gone, cried Richard, pointing to them to all. Mistress Nutter looked confounded, and without a word marched to Alison, who was full of alarm and astonishment by the arm, and hurried her out of the hall. As they disappeared, the young man flew towards Nicholas, whose extraordinary proceedings had excited general amazement that other dancers had moved out of the way, so that free space was left for his majoration. Great scandalised by the exhibition which he looked upon as the effect of intoxication. Sir Ralph called loudly to him to stop, but he paid no attention to the summons, but whirled on with momentarily increased rapidation of setting old Adam Whitworth, Gregory and Dickon, who severally ventured to place themselves in his path to enforce their master's injunction, until at last, just as Richard reached him, he uttered a loud cry, fell to the ground, insensible. By Sir Ralph's man, he was instantly lifted up and transported to his own chamber. The unexpected and extraordinary incident put an end to the ball and the whole guests, after taking a respectful ungrateful leave of the horse part not in most admired disorder but full of wonder by most persons the squire's fantastical vagaries as they were termed were traced to the vast quantity of wine he had drunk but a few others shook their heads and said he was evidently bewitched and that mother 
chat arts and Nancy Redfern were at the bottom of it. As to the portrait of Arsol de Henton, it was found under the table and it was said that Nicholas himself had pulled it down, but this he obstinately denied when afterwards taken to task for his indecorous behaviour, and to his dying day he asserted and believed that he had danced the brawl with Arsol de Henton, and never he would say had mortal man such a partner. From that night two portraits in the banqueting hall were regarded with great awe by the inmates of the Abbey.